Welcome everybody uh, for this very exciting session uh, of the Ames Next Einstein for Forum. And uh, I must say, uh, this is a very positive feeling to have all of our uh, young African scientists joining us in Africa and around the world. And of course, the spirit of this meeting is that our ability to understand nature connects all of us as human beings. And although we are caught in the middle of this pandemic, technology is allowing us to meet and to share our ideas and our dreams. And the Ames Next Einstein Forum is very likely one of the most positive gatherings taking place anywhere on the planet. We're all excited uh, and united by the prospect of a generation of young African scientists who will change, change the face of science in the future. So in this session, we will hear from what, some of the world's top scientists and see what guidance they have to offer this new generation. So the first is Rich Roberts, who won his Nobel Prize in 1993 for understanding that the genetic information encoded in our DNA, in a mathematical code, can occur in disconnected pieces. The genes are not always in one connected strand. This knowledge was very useful for medicine. So in this short video, he offers some advice to aspiring young scientists. Welcome, uh, Rich Roberts. Uh, Thank you. No Nobel Prize winner in 1993 uh, for discovering a very important feature of genes. In particular, he, he, he says that luck plays a big role in, uh, in science. So please elaborate. Luckiest thing that ever happened to me happened um, on 9-11. Um, this was the time when the first plane went into the World Trade Tower. I was booked on that plane until two weeks before it took off. And I was on my way to a meeting in California. The meeting in California was moved forward one day. And so I took that plane the day before it went into the World Trade Tower. Wow. Now that is luck, that, that is luck. So I always try to remember that I'm living now on borrowed time as a result of that. So I guess this has made you appreciate life. Very much so, very much so. Yeah. You know, I, I've always really wanted to help other people when I could. And I think I felt that more strongly since winning the Nobel Prize, actually, mm -hmm. because one of the things I found was that before I won the prize, you know, I would talk and people would or pretend to listen, but they'd rarely act. And after I won it, people would listen more intently and very often would act this. And I thought, well, you know, why not take advantage of this piece of luck? Nobel laureates really can do uh, yeah. to help cause. And yeah. I've tried to think find things that have both humanitarian causes but also have some science if science is being misused i, I try to help with that too I, I also think it's very important for scientists to learn to speak to the public in language they can understand i have something i call the grandmother test which i the students and postdocs who work with me and i say go and talk to your mother and tell her what it is you do in the lab every day and convince her that you are a wonderful scientist and get it to a point where not only does she understand it, but she understands it well enough to go and boast about you to all her friends in yeah. terms that are real, you know, where, where she's really spreading it. Yeah. And I found this to be actually a, a lot of students find this useful um, to go and talk to the lay public about what they do and explain in layman's terms what it is they're doing. Um, so let me ask you for uh, any sort of words of advice you would give to an aspiring young scientist in Africa in particular. What should they do? The first thing to do is to find out what it is you're really passionate about. So, you know, if you love physics or you love chemistry or you love biology, um, then make sure that this is what you choose to pursue. And I personally, I, I'm a big fan of biology because there is so much that we don't know. And there are many places where we can make interesting discoveries. And it can also have a very 
profound impact on life, um, some of these discoveries. For instance, you know, the discovery I made for the Nobel Prize, some, oh, 1977, long time ago now, um, only about three years ago, was there a practical application of this in medicine? It's been applied by actually an ex postdoc of mine um, to spinal muscular atrophy. And he discovered a cure for the disease because the mechanism that caused the disease was based on my discovery. And so it can sometimes take a long time before basic research can, can lead to practical consequences. But almost always, if you're doing basic research and you make discoveries, it will have practical consequences. It may just take a long time. Right. And the nice thing about biology is that because we don't know very much, it becomes much easier to make discoveries. And then once you've found this thing that you really love to do, then talk to mentors, talk to teachers, talk to professionals, read a lot. Uh, and not just about the maybe one thing that you're focused on, read around your subject too and find out how other things, other discoveries may actually make it easy for you to pursue the thing you want to pursue and then find a career path and head down it. But the one thing I would say, and I feel very strongly about this, is if you're really engrossed in doing something and then you find out about something that is far more interesting, switch and do it. Okay, don't keep pursuing something if you see something else that's more exciting and more interesting. The once you're really enthusiastic about something and get into it, work is not work anymore. Work is a hobby, it's fun. I don't consider myself to work, and yet if I ask my wife, she will tell me I work all the time. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we also have another short movie. Uh, from a mathematician this time. Uh, his name is Kosher Burkar, and he won the Fields Medal in 2018 for his theorems in algebraic geometry. Uh, his origins are very interesting. He was a refugee from the Kurdish region of Iran, uh, having lived through the Iran-Iraq war uh, in that area as a child, but he went on to pursue pure mathematics. I was born in 1978 in the Kurdish region in Iran, uh, very close to the border with Iraq. Um, um, just a few months after I was born, there was a revolution in Iran. And then also after a couple of years, there was uh, the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted for eight years. Uh, so most of my primary education happened during that time of war. Uh, so this probably is similar to the experience of some of you uh, in recent times, uh, unfortunately, because there are so many conflicts uh, around the world. Um, so when I was uh, a child, my parents were very serious about education, so they encouraged uh, me and my siblings to, to study as uh, uh, good as we can. And I was also quite lucky to have an older brother who was uh, also interested in, in education and also in general in science and in technology. Uh, he tried to teach me some mathematics in middle school. And uh, the schools were that we had, we had, you could say, good teachers, but the schools were very basic, essentially almost nothing in the school, just a, a room, basically. There was no other equipment in the in the class, just blackboard and so on. Um, so we didn't have anything really special. And uh, but by the time that I got into high school, I started to uh, study mathematics more seriously. And the reason for this is because I um, started to enjoy mathematics, not just for getting grades, but I felt that there is something interesting in mathematics just in the way that people enjoy listening to music or uh, people listening to poetry i thought that there is some kind of inner beauty in mathematics also that i can enjoy one of the things that i really liked uh, even when i was young was that mathematics is very precise and there is no basically no argument you prove if you prove a result then it will stay there forever only reading and learning is not enough. In fact, I just wanted also to have my own mathematics. So I started at least try to do research. Uh, obviously, I didn't prove anything significant, anything important, but that's not the point. The point is that I just had this feeling that 
that process of discovery is also something really enjoyable. And that's something anyone can do under reasonable uh, conditions. There is simply no difference between an American student, British student, and an African student. It's all about education. It's all about uh, being in the right environment, uh, having people to support you. Uh, but even without support, it's actually possible to do something. It's possible to learn. It's possible to, uh, to succeed. You mentioned your older brother, but to what extent did your family and your community in, uh, in Iran in Kurdistan, uh, did they support and believe in you? Um, well, there were some kind of support, you could say. For example, uh, just being in that particular culture was uh, important for me because even though we didn't have so much things, I mean, in a, in a sense, uh, we were not poor, but we also were not rich. Uh, but the thing is that cultures can support people mentally. For example, I never felt alone. But now people in the richest countries, they have the problem. It's, in fact, it's becoming one of the biggest problems, that people become alone. Uh, but in cultures, especially these traditional cultures, maybe it's the same in Africa, people can get social support, even if it's not directly about mathematics, but they can be happy in their own environment. And that's, that's quite important. So yes. my family tried to push me maybe to study well, to get a job and so on. My older brother influence was uh, much deeper because he also believed in learning just for the sake of uh, the knowledge and to enjoy to create something, not just to get a job. Uh, so that was quite important. But, uh, but if you mean by support like people in my school or in the community to come and tell me uh, you are great that you go to become a mathematician definitely not <laughs> <laughs> fantastic okay i hope you enjoyed those uh and now it's a great pleasure to introduce our three live guests um and actually they all share a common interest which is in light uh donna strickland manipulated light into pulses or chirps of unprecedented intensity. And for this, she won her Nobel Prize uh, rather recently. Uh, Jacques Maresco used light to perform surgery remotely across the Atlantic. And Francois Angler uh, used, uh, understood how particles gain mass and avoid moving at the speed of light. So uh, each one of them used mathematics. Uh, Donna's breakthrough was guided by a clear understanding of how light waves travel and interfere. And Jack's innovations in surgery relied very heavily on mathematics and informatics. And Francois was led by mathematical theory to predict a new particle, which was discovered 50 years after the prediction at the Large Hadron Collider. So to all of them, let me invite you to contribute now, and in particular to discuss what do you think about the role of mathematics in science, and what motivates you? Is it the beauty of nature, or is, is it the usefulness of your work? So maybe let me uh, begin with Donna, uh, who is joining us from Canada, and this is very early for her, so let me just begin by thanking her for <laughs> joining us so early. Donna, over to you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed those uh, videos. I think too that uh, I liked math in high school. I thought of them as puzzles and I enjoy doing puzzles. Uh, and so obviously uh, math is the language of um, physics. And, uh, you know, in Canada, we should be bilingual. And I have to tell you, I can only speak English, but I always said math is my second language. <laughs> that was all I had was English and math. Otherwise, I can't speak to anyone. Um, right. But now I'm much more in the lab than doing math, I have to confess. Although not right now because of COVID, but without COVID, I'm more in the lab. Right. Thank you. So, uh, Jacques, can I go over to you for some yes. introductory comments? <laughs> yes. Just By the way, um, let me also mention that Jacques is founding a school for surgery in Rwanda which will train people from all over Africa in the kind of fancy techniques which he is using. Please go ahead. 
So, uh, no, no, you imagine I'm very proud. I think that Neil Turok is uh, a politician, a diplomat, and a psychologist because he knows very well the <laughs> ego of a surgeon. Because he invited me to join this lecture uh, some days ago, but just he said, I have only three Nobel Prize, one field medals, etc. So Not enough. I, w I was very proud. And when I announced that to my <laughs> wife, that I participate to a Congress of Mathematics, she said, oh, they know that you are so useless at maths because I'm really totally useless at maths. <laughs> I just want to explain that why I am fascinated by mathematics, computer science, etc., even if I don't understand this science. It is just because, and I will speak about that tomorrow during my lecture, you know, my background is a normal background of uh, surgeons. But in 1991, I attended an exceptional lecture. It was in Germany, given by Rick Satava, a surgeon of the U.S. Army, a surgeon. And uh, he has explained it was in 1991 the, for surgery, the future power of Internet. It didn't exist in Europe. It was 1992 the development of robotics that didn't exist, the development of mathematics applied to virtual reality, augmented reality. For a surgeon like me, I have understood less than 20% of the lecture, but I came back and uh, I immediately with my co-workers, I said, we need to build uh, an institute totally dedicated to computer science and surgery because the way of the revolution in surgery will not be coming from surgeons, but from computer scientists. And that is the reason we have created uh, IRCAD in France now, 25 years ago or more. And now we have the same. We have an institute mirror in, uh, in Taiwan. We have uh, one in Sao Paulo, one in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we are going to have one in, uh, in, uh, in China, one in US also, and something exceptional it will be in Kigali, the IRCAD Africa. So it is not only in a, a, a school and an education school for surgeons, it is also a big team of computer scientists, artificial intelligence engineers, researchers, developers. And uh, we will have this common uh, team. Uh, I think we are going to recruit around between 30 and 40 uh, researchers uh, computer scientists, especially artificial intelligence dedicated to, to surgery. So it's a reason I'm so proud to, to explain that because, uh, uh, you know, mathematics has really application to save life. And uh, that is uh, really, you, I always say one brain of a surgeon plus one brain of a surgeon, it's only one brain because we think uh, the same. <laughs> but if we have a strong team of computer scientists and mathematicians, it changes everything. So thank you for the invitation. Lovely. It's really a pleasure for me to chair that. Thank you. And uh, let me encourage the attendees to attend uh, Jacques' uh, talk uh, tomorrow. Um, so finally, let me turn to Francois Angler. Uh, I'm very lucky to have Francois as a very close personal friend. And in fact, I invited him to visit Rwanda a couple of years ago uh, uh, after he won his uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, but I knew him even before the prize. <laughs> he was just as interesting. So uh, let me ask uh, Francois to, co to comment uh, on, on these topics. On which topics? <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is your... Yeah, you, you yeah. know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I am not sure what I wanted to do when I was young. And, uh, but I always liked mathematics. And just uh, people always said around me, they were discussing, uh, uh, and I discussed and asked something, and they say, oh, I don't understand because it's mathematics. I never had this type of feeling for me, it's like being born. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and uh, but uh, parents and the mathematical teacher, they always said that I should uh, go to be an engineer, which I did at the end. I am an engineer, and I hated it, I must say. <laughs> I hated it because, uh, after all, 
I was really I realized that I was more uh, more more interested in trying to find the reason for what uh, things were working, and uh, so I was more and more driven to uh, theoretical physics. So after being an engineer, I decided to do physics, and uh, then uh, I found a way that. Uh, work became a total pleasure. As I hear with Hobbes here, I think that had the same feeling for me. Also, I had the impression at least once I was in physics that uh, I never worked in my life and I have no intention to start. <laughs> Okay, let, let me also mention that uh, Francois has an incredible life story. Uh, like uh, Kosha, he was a refugee and he lived through a war, uh, but this time in um, possibly even more extreme conditions. Uh, he was a hidden child um, where uh, when uh, the Nazis occupied Belgium, um, a Catholic priest helped to hide uh, him and his family and uh, he was uh, isolated um, and uh, managed to live through uh, this terrible period and survive it and somehow draw strength uh, from it. Uh, and then um, uh, Francois visited Rwanda and of course uh, visited the Genocide Memorial Museum in, in Rwanda. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Francois. Yes. So I won't talk, of course, about my genocide and your genocide. That's not the point. And, uh, but certainly I came here to give some lecture and I, as I say, I was very impressed by what I saw at Ames. You invited me at Ames and uh, I gave some lecture on physics and on the evolution of physics and so like this. Being in Rwanda and uh, in, uh, and frequently these students which were extremely bright, but all of them had tragedy in their families. And I could not avoid the, the fact that I wanted to go to the memorial of genocide. And, uh, this impressed me a lot. Uh, and what impressed me even more than the stories and the way it was thought for uh, uh, Rwanda was the fact that uh, uh, I discovered that in the same uh, memorial they had a, uh, a part of the building that was devoted to different kinds of genocide, including the Holocaust of Jews, where I escaped directly, and uh, and the Armenian genocide, and uh, oh well, anyone you want to cite. But this I found an extremely impressive and humanitarian uh, thing that you can not only talk about your own living in through the genocide, but also realize that this is a plague in all humanity. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Francois. Let's see if we, uh, if we have uh, any questions um, from the audience. Uh, so, I have the first one. Um, it says, uh, I love the advice to switch this to something we love when we find it more interesting. However, the funding model in Africa in research is often too restrictive and we have to deliver pre-specified milestones. How do we change that culture? So let's go back to Donna. <laughs> I, I wish I had an answer to that one, you know, I think. I think a lot of people, though, you know, write their grants and, and have their milestones, but they probably also have little sideline projects 
on the side. And if they take off, then of course you can write that for your next grant. Um, but I agree, it's hard to have an off the wall idea and, and get it funded. And so you sort of have to almost do it as a sideline project until it gets some traction. Um, it doesn't stop you from talking to your colleagues and getting all the help that you might need. And, and without the funding, you can start just uh, getting the idea. I remember my postdoc supervisor, Paul Corcoran, you know, he, he always had just him and one postdoc and that was the whole group for a while. Now he has 20 something, but um, he would say he had the whole experiment in his head and knew that it would work because he had actually sort of done it in his it. head all the way through. <laughs> so that by the time he needed to really do it, he was sure it was going to work. And he, and he pretty, you know, he could convince people that it was the way to go. So I, I think that's it. I hope we get over this idea of being very applied and being milestones, because I think if, and it was already mentioned, it takes a long time to, to start with the idea and get to the application and governments and the people that, you know, then vote in their governments and stuff have to really understand that, that there has to be the backbone of science so that 20 years later, we're using that science to make the applications. So, all of us, especially I think has already been said, the Nobel Prize winners seem to be listened to more than other people. And that's one of the things that we have to get out and keep telling all of our governments that we have to keep supporting basic science so that down the road, we keep having new applications. So uh, Jacques, you've already hinted that uh, the role of basic science in everything you do and, and how you realized something was on the horizon coming from basic science. Uh, can you say something about uh, funding of science and priorities? Okay, uh, I, I think it's easier for us uh, because I think that when uh, it's uh, very easy to understand by politicians uh, or uh, industrial uh, because we have immediately the application and application is a new, uh, uh, new kind of surgery. So our goal is to invent the future in surgery. And you know that everybody knows somebody who is going to be operated or was uh, uh, been operated. So something important that we explain to all uh, our donators, for example, is that uh, what I said as an introduction, that really, uh, if we want to invent the future of surgery, and that changed totally, especially with artificial intelligence for the strategy, but also uh, during an operation and after an operation, uh, we need a very strong team of uh, computer scientists. That is sure. And for us, uh, I think it has been very easy to attract some African uh, engineers and, uh, and uh, computer scientists from, uh, from Africa. Uh, today we have just eight, but we think it will be uh, more than 40 in the next two or three years. And I think that um, a lot of uh, young engineers or computer scientists can be attracted by uh, uh, healthcare program and uh, they immediately understand how important it is the work they have uh, they, they have to do with us but and that was very interesting for Africa we we have created uh, uh, a cell of donators in France for a big project that we have with IRCAD Africa in research uh, and uh, I, I have explained to our African partners that that is also very important to have a private donation from uh, Africa. And for example, in two days, I have a, I have a video conference with a very strong industrial in Kigali. And uh, his job is also to, to have some, uh, you know, to, to stimulate some fundraising in Africa. And just to explain, because uh, just before you speak, Spoke about the government. What, what uh, for me has been uh, really totally, I've been totally impressed. Uh, I, I was lucky, so lucky to have a meeting uh, five times with uh, President Paul Kagame. And I remember the first meeting was for me exceptional because uh, for me, he is a great chief of state because he, ha he has totally understood the future and how the digital environment will be important for all the different specialty, include sure uh, patient care. And, uh, you know, it was decided, I remember we, we had a meeting in the Marriott Hotel and the decision to put from the government uh, more than $16 million just for the building has been taken by Paul Kagame in five minutes. <laughs> I, 
He sent before the Minister of Health, the Ambassador of Rwanda in France. But when I have uh, explained the project, it was immediately yes. So I think that uh, I was totally surprised. I was also totally surprised by how this young generation of uh, uh, African, especially in Rwanda, and that is also what was just said before, perhaps due to the genocide. I think that uh, I see a parallel between Israel and uh, Rwanda. Israel, you know, it's the same. Uh, a huge uh, genocide, and after that, a young generation wanted to prove that they, they can be so high-level brains for the world. And I think that it is exactly what I have... Uh, that was my feeling after the visit of the memorial. And we invite every year, we have uh, five, eight uh, young engineers coming in Strasbourg for one month. And I am impressed how hard worker they are. So very brilliant brain, but also hard worker. But uh, you know what I have to say is that I, I, I am here since uh, half an hour, a little more. And all the speakers said uh, it's not a job. It's not a job. Never, I think that I work. And that is exactly the feeling we have here in, in this institute. All the engineers, they, they don't look at the hours. They, they don't know. It's really a pleasure, as you said before, a, cre a pleasure to create something. Thank you. So now a uh, question from Francois, for Francois from uh, Tiano Ndai. Ndai. Uh, I'm not sure where Tiano is, but the question is, how did you manage to win your Nobel Prize? Was it your goal since the beginning? Or did you start focusing on it at a certain time? I must say it was certainly not my aim in my life. I didn't care at all about that. <laughs> and uh, actually, well, I'm not saying that I was not happy to have the Nobel Prize, but <laughs> I... I realized the day, the day before I had it that I, I knew that all kind of people who had the Nobel Prize had time to ask a lot of people uh, asking to, 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 uh, recommend them for the Nobel Prize or doing all of guys. <laughs> then I suddenly, uh, uh, realized that I hadn't contacted anyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I say maybe I'm not even, um, nominated, so I didn't know. And uh, of course, the day, the day after I realized that, after all, I had a good chance to have it. <laughs> so it was there. I was interested by the science, by, by, by physics, by understanding things that we do not understand. And that was all the thing. And certainly, I remember when 50 years before the Nobel Prize, I, uh, <clears throat> and 50 years about the Nobel, before the Nobel Prize, when <clears throat> we discovered my friend Robert Braut and me, uh, what gave us later the Nobel Prize, we celebrated it. And it was even a bigger pleasure than, than, than the moment that I knew I got to know. I also didn't think about it and I didn't try, but I have a, a funny story about it because it was 1985 when we wrote the paper that got my PhD supervisor and I the Nobel Prize. And that uh, Christmas time, I was sending out cards and it was a takeoff on the people who write form letters who just, you know, tell about your whole life that year. And so it was just really off the wall. It started with, you've, you've probably heard from the news that our CIA operation went well. Our children got parts. It looks good on the mantle next to the Pulitzer. So it was just a total crazy thing. But I was separating them in the lab when my supervisor comes in and he reads this and he goes, but Dana, you have not won the Nobel Prize. I said, well, I don't have kids on Broadway either, or a Pulitzer, so I don't think anyone is going to be thinking that I think I have a Nobel Prize. So, 
But to Gerard, you did not joke about the Nobel Prize. You could joke about all the rest, but at no times did you joke about winning the Nobel Prize. So to me, while I was doing this supposedly Nobel Prize winning work, I was joking about winning, not, not thinking in any way, shape or form that I had done something that would win the Nobel Prize. So that's the way I see it. And obviously it happened 35 years ago. And then you get woken up one morning and be told that you've won it. And you've, you know, long since thought, okay, great. <laughs> so, and, and as somebody else, I, Rich Roberts said, you know, for 35 years, the high intensity laser community knew me and maybe listened to me, but nobody else listened to me. And now I'm talking to you in Africa because the Royal Swedish Academy decided that I was worth talking to or something. It's a, it's a very weird feeling. We have another question. Uh, if you don't mind me going to that question. It was uh, from Sarah uh, Suleiman. The question reads as follows. How do, do, you, uh, do we think about Nobel Prizes as a model for acknowledging the collaborative uh, research model of today, particularly in Africa? Should we move to different model? So Donna, do you want to, as we have a mic? Uh. <laughs> well, you know, and I was, I was also thinking while people were talking, my favorite country to talk about is Korea. You know, they, they were somebody without very many resources. And after their war, they thought, what are we going to do? I'm going to put, we're going to put our eggs in the science basket. And they built a science city and they did a lot. And so now if you go around the world, people are using Samsungs and they're driving Hyundais and LG appliances. And it's just done an amazing thing for their economy that this is the road they went down. But when I visited last year, their question from their member of their National Academy said, but Donna, how do we win the Nobel Prize? <laughs> is that really more important than, you know, saving your whole economy? Um, but the thing about the Nobel Prize, which is different than almost every other prize, it's for one thing, right? I don't think I would have won a Lifetime Achievement Award, but I did that one thing. And so I think in that case, it's open to anybody. It's, it's, you just have to have that one novel idea that, that you turn a corner away from something else and it starts something new. So I think that can be done anywhere. And I don't think it has to be done at a big uh, institution necessarily. So, but I think it's also, as somebody said early on, it's luck. There's a lot of luck involved when you're going to get one of these very few things. Uh, thank you, Donna. We're going to take another question that touches on women. I really wanted to um, take that question. It's from Sarah. A question from Prof. Donna. What is your opinion about how to promote more women Nobel laureate? Well, yeah, okay. A lot was made out of the fact that it had been 55 years since I, you know, between me and Maria Gopat Mayer. But now it's only been two years between Andrea and me. Uh, and I contacted Andrea right away and I said, I've started a new club. It's for female physics Nobel laureates. It's the first time ever that two of us were alive at the same time, right? I mean, Marie Curie had died before Maria Gopat Mayer won. She had passed away before I won. So I think it's, you know, I think the doors, is opened up and I think you're going to see that women, I mean, this year, this, this year, there were quite a few uh, female winners. And so I think this idea that it's going to not happen very often is old news. I think we're going to see women uh, be recognized now. Thank you. That's a great inspiration. Peut-on inspirer un développement des innovations digitales en mode open source? So, okay. Uh I, I think my, my answer is, uh, is very clear. I can uh, answer in French or in English. Uh, en français, uh, bah, quasiment tous les développements qu'on fait de logiciels, 90% on les met en open source. Donc, euh, c'est clair. Et de plus en plus, les industriels, notamment dans la robotique, le mettent aussi en, en open source. So just in English to say that in, in the, the work we do, that means on robotics or on virtual reality or augmented reality, majority of our software are open source. So uh, there is no, no limit to use that. And uh, if you want, you can contact the director of research of IRCAD and uh, he will explain all the differencing that we have in, in open source. So thank you very much. Um, just to update you that we are trying to get uh, Prof. Neil Turok on Hermit. Uh, while we wait for him, 
um, he wanted us to play another uh, video. Came up with as a, a new innovative idea called Hypercab. Hypercab uh, may be near to rock, uh, uh, we have an, uh, enough time just to talk about this, but I want just to show you how does it really work properly. So we start this idea uh, implementation exp uh, by experiment. Uh, we did massive testing in the community, uh, in the market, uh, people who have been active during the lockdown uh, here in Rwanda. So when you can see here on the picture, this is just a representation of this uh, uh, massive testing and we were uh, interested to detect that person who's positive. So, and then uh, with that proof of concept that I mentioned, we have been able just to, 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 to use and to implement in our lab the, uh, the, the pool, the 20 pool size, uh, uh, where we combine the samples in a, in a tube before testing them, uh, and then we can just able be able just to detect uh, the the pool which is positive, as you can see here. But other pools which are now negative can be declared the negative, and we speed up the feedback for the the results. And of course, for this pool which is positive, we go back, we test one by one until we detect those who are just positive. This is how really the the pool testing works. Uh, uh, on molecular level in our lab. And then with this great idea, the Rwanda has been just able to scale up the technology uh, over the country. So you can see here the different sites where we are testing using this, this pooling uh, uh, approach where we have, of course, we have molecular uh, testing machines. Uh, so this really has been very helpful just to, to, to maintain our prevalence law very low uh, with this uh, scale up um, um, uh, approach. In conclusion, the pool testing has double benefits. So you know, one is just minimizing the total number of the test to reduce cost and also maximizing the speed of the testing process to reduce the viral spread. And then we know increasing the sample volume in RT-PCR machines to enable pooling testing at, uh, of larger group size could enable, enable again, even greater cost savings at lower prevalence. This is really very, very, uh, very informative and very nice. All fat mass testing is initially costly. Maintaining a low prevalence and indeed eliminating COVID-19 infection will, with the implementation of a group testing become progressively more affordable. So the targets, as I mentioned here, we start with the, the where we have mass gathering, like in the market. And then now Rwanda is using this just to test the arrival passengers at the airports who are supposed just to come with 72 hours RTPC negative results. And then we apply this and they can just be able to speed up the, 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 the results within 24 hours, the, the, the passenger, they, they get their results. Of course, we apply this in different institutions, and now schools have opened, so we are also applying this in the schools, and this can also be applied in different other settings. And a good example is just in South Africa. South Africa and the Edinburgh, they have also started just to apply this pooling uh, uh, testing approach. Uh, before I just uh, conclude, I want just to acknowledge and thank all of our uh, collaborators, of course, Professor Niturok, uh, we Frida I mentioned, and the Professor uh, Jacob Sub, we have been just behind this technology. Also, uh, our great collaborators. Of course, I can't forget other institutions that you see here, especially our Rwanda Joint Task Force, which is gathering all of the institutions involved in this COVID-19 responses in Rwanda. Thank you very much. And uh, now I just want to uh, thank all of our participants and encourage, uh, thank all of our speakers and the people who made the videos and encourage all the participants to enjoy the rest of the forum. Um, and, uh, you know, keep in mind that we're all backing you. Uh, you're the real people. Uh, you're the future. And uh, we will do everything we can to make it possible for you to make the same kind of discoveries which you heard about today. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the forum. <laughs>